Okay, good afternoon. My name is Alon Confino. I'm the director of the Institute for Holocaust, Genocide and Memory Studies at UMass Amherst. And I'd like to welcome you to our event today, which is the crowning event of a year long uh, seminar about race and representations, co directed by Stephen Klingman and uh, Whitney Battle Batiste. Um, about this time last year, we thought that um, it uh, behooves on us, given what was going on in America with respect to George Floyd and uh, structural racism and the debate over it, to have the yearly seminar of the Institute, which brings together uh, a one-year Institute fellows to do it on race and representations. Um, and together with Stephen and Whitney, we gathered a group of excellent scholars. And I'd like to uh, really thank uh, Stephen, Whitney, and the seminar participants for a great year. Um, it's the kind of intellectual engagement that we are um, that we are fortunate to have at UMass and also at the institute. Now it was of course difficult because usually our fellows in the seminars meet at the Institute, which has a beautiful building, over dinner with some wine. Well, this didn't happen this year. Um, but I, uh, I think it's a very good idea if we'll do a reunion in the fall, and if you want also in the spring, and we'll have an even more lavish dinner than usual in order to celebrate also our release from COVID. Hopefully we are on the way to it. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, thank our participants. Uh, I'd like to thank, uh, to thank Dean Krauthammer. I'm going to introduce the Dean, who is then uh, give the word to Stephen, who will introduce our speakers, and then we'll hear the talks, and then we'll have a lively conversation. So it is my uh, pleasure and honor to have with us today, opening uh, this special event, the Dean of College of uh, Humanities and Fine Arts and Professor of History, Barbara Krauthammer. Barbara is a premier scholar of 19th century United States history, one of the premier scholars in the nation, uh, focusing on antebellum slavery and emancipation, on African-American history, Native American history, and critical race and gender history and theory. Uh, I'd like to mention briefly two of her landmark books. Um, one is Black Slaves, Indian Masters, Slavery, Emancipation, and Citizenship in the Native American South, published by UNC Press in 2013. is the first full-length study of slavery and the lives of enslaved people among two Indian nations. The book reveals the centrality of slavery and racial ideology in native leaders' definitions of Indian sovereignty, as well as US federal policy towards Indian peoples and territory. Barbara also co-authored Envisioning Participation, Envisioning Emancipation, Black Americans and the End of Slavery with her colleague Deborah Willis. The book featured 150 historical photographs of enslaved and free African Americans from the 1850s through the 1930s. The book received uh, several awards, most notably the 2013 NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Literary Work in Nonfiction. In 2017, the Association of Black Women Historians awarded Barbara the Williams Leadership Award in recognition of her scholarship and work to create opportunities for Black women in higher education. In her previous role as Dean of the Graduate School at UMass, she established campus-wide fellowships and mentoring programs to support the recruitment and retention of graduate students from underrepresented groups. Since 2020, Barbara is the Dean of the College of Humanities and Fine Arts 
I guess when she thought of applying for the job, she didn't know what is in store for her, that is COVID, but we were fortunate to have her leadership during this difficult time. And in her current role as the Dean, she is also leading initiatives to support students and faculty of color and to promote greater outreach to local communities. So it's my great honor uh, to give the word to Baba Krauthammer. Thank you, Alon, for that incredibly and unnecessarily generous introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone, depending on, I suppose, what time zone you're in. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this event, to this roundtable event on race and representation. Um, as Alon mentioned, the last in a year-long series that's been organized by the Institute for Holocaust, Genocide, and Memory Studies at UMass Amherst. I want to say a few words about the Institute. The Institute was founded by James E. Young, our distinguished university professor emeritus of English and Judaic studies at UMass Amherst. The Institute opened in the spring of 2011 and was initially established to house the very generous gift of a permanent teaching exhibition on the Holocaust called A Reason to Remember, Roth, Germany, 1933 to 1942, which was donated to our university by the Jewish Federation of Western Massachusetts. So we're very grateful to the Jewish Federation of Western Massachusetts for this initial donation and to Professor Young for his initial leadership. I also want to acknowledge and extend our gratitude and recognition to Pamela and Robert Jacobs of Washington, D.C., Brenda and Al Curtis from Springfield, Massachusetts, and our anonymous local donor for their generous support and dedication to the Institute. Thanks to their support and certainly and undoubtedly thanks to the visionary and dynamic leadership of Professor Alan Confino, the Institute hosts numerous classes and brings together leading scholars for conferences, lectures, movie screenings, and other events such as this one to address the most pressing issues of our time. Today, of course, we're joined by three distinguished and prolific scholars, as well as our seminar co-directors, outstanding scholars and leaders in their own right, Professors Whitney Battle Baptiste from the Anthropology Department at UMass Amherst and Professor Stephen Klingman from our English Department. And I'm sure that they and our guest speakers will give us what will definitely be a thought-provoking and illuminating discussion about these critical questions about race and representation representation in a global context. Each year, the IHGMS brings together an interdisciplinary group of scholars to offer insights about these critical issues, to share perspectives, to prompt thought and discussion and continued learning. And so it's my great pleasure to turn things over to our seminar co-director, Professor Stephen Klingman. Well, thank you very much, Barbara, Dean Krauthammer. It's a great pleasure to have you here today, and we really appreciate uh, uh, your introducing us. Uh, on behalf of Whitney and myself, thanks to, to Alon Confino and the Institute for hosting this event, as well as to the wonderful, absolutely wonderful group we've been working with this year. As you've heard, for the past year at the IHGMS, we've had an interdisciplinary group of scholars from UMass and the four colleges engaged in exploring the links between race and representation. After the murder of George Floyd, these questions are very much on our minds, but of course the issue goes much farther back than that, and it applies around the world as well. The connection between race and representation has at least two different aspects. One concerns how different racial groups are stationed in the social order, and the other how different groups are imaged in public discourse. In exploring the connection between them for the past year, we've ranged very widely from the USA to India, to the Caribbean, to Latin America, the Middle East, to South Africa. Topics have involved the history of slavery and legacies of resistance, literature, art history, rhetoric, translation, among others. So now we come to our culminating event for the year, hosting three distinguished speakers for a round table on these topics. And it's an event we're really excited about. 
Each of our speakers works both from experience in the field and as a matter of commitment around issues of race. Each of them is quite brilliant in their own right. Together, we're confident they'll make for a truly fascinating discussion. So in the interest of getting to their remarks rather than mine, I'll keep my introductions of them quite brief. Each of our speakers will speak for about 15 minutes and then we'll open up for discussion. We'll go in alphabetical order. So I'll start with Jacob Lamini. Uh, Professor Lamini is a South African historian of Africa with an interest in pre-colonial, colonial and post-colonial African history. Despite his young age, if I can put it that way, he's the author of a, uh, a, um, a, a growing number of books. Uh, he's the author of the terrorist album, Apartheid's Insurgents, Collaborators and the Security Police, published in 2020. And I have to say an absolutely wonderful book. In the same year, he published Safari Nation, a social history of the Kruger National Park. He also in 2014 published Askari, a story of collaboration and betrayal in the anti-apartheid struggle, which won South Africa's Alan Payton Award, which is the highest award for nonfiction you can get in South Africa. And in 2009, he published Native Nostalgia, uh, an, a hugely influential book. Jacob has held fellowships and visiting positions at the University of Barcelona, Harvard University, the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, and the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Study. One of his um, other attributes is that he's a qualified field guide with an interest in comparative and global histories of conservation and national parks. Carol Phillips is the author of 11 novels, including The Nature of Blood, a Distant Shore, The Lost Child, and A View of the Empire at Sunset, as well as five essay collections and a number of anthologies, film scripts, and plays. And I must say, it's been a personal pleasure for me uh, and honor to have been associated with his work over the years. Um, he was born in St. Kitts and then moved with his parents to England at the age of four months. And his work explores themes of identity and belonging in the Caribbean, the United States, and Europe. He's widely regarded as among the most significant writers in contemporary English, and his work has been translated into multiple languages. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of the Arts and has won numerous awards, including the Commonwealth Writers' Prize, the James Tate Black Memorial Prize, the Lannan Literary Award, and the Martin Luther King Memorial Prize. Our third speaker, Manisha Sinha, is someone many of you will know and recognize because she taught here at, at UMass for uh, some 20 years. And Manisha, it's a great pleasure to have you back. Currently, she's the Draper Chair in American History at the University of Connecticut. And this year, a Mellon Distinguished Scholar in Residence at the American Antiquarian Society. She's the author of The Counter-Revolution of Slavery, Politics and Ideology in Antebellum, South Carolina which was featured in the New York Times 1619 project. And her more recent book, The Slaves' Cause, A History of Abolition, published in 2016, was long listed for the National Book Award for Nonfiction and drew wide notice everywhere. Uh, Manisha is the author and editor of other books and numerous articles and has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the New York Review of Books, among others. And she has a new book project on the on the reconstruction of American democracy after the Civil War, uh, a project that is now under contract. So it's a tremendous pleasure to have all three of you. We're really looking forward to hearing what you have to say. And Jacob, we're going to begin with you. Yeah. Uh, I I should start uh, by thanking uh, Professor uh, Confina, uh, Dean uh, Krautamer, uh, and of course, uh, uh, Professors uh, Klegman and uh, Battle Batiste uh, for uh, you know, hosting us uh, this afternoon and for putting this together. Uh, I, of course, am excited uh, to be uh, you know, in conversation uh, with uh, uh, Manisha Sina and uh, Carl Phillips, uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, you know, what is sure to be a, a wonderful conversation. I, of course, should also thank uh, for a start uh, Paz for, you know, taking care of the logistics uh, to make it possible for all of us to be here this afternoon. Uh, and of course, thank you all for taking the time to to listen to us. Uh, so I, I thought I would uh, get at the theme of uh, race and representation by sharing a work that I am starting to develop 
uh, by sharing with you a research project that I've been working on uh, for the past year. Uh, and I'm just gonna share uh, you know, a few images to in some ways help illustrate uh, what it is I'm trying to do, but also what it is I'm going against. Uh, so I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen. Uh, so you can actually, uh, so just bear with me, excuse me. Uh, So I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, yeah. So uh, what I am trying to do uh, with this new project, uh, and I, I'm not giving you the title of it here, uh, but the working title of it is uh, uh, The Archive Machine, uh, and the subtitle is The Truth Commission and the Archaeology of Apartheid. Uh, and part of what I'm trying to do in some ways is to uh, cut race down to analytical size. I mean, this might sound odd for someone who's concerned with the history of South Africa, but that's exactly what I'm trying to do, uh, which is in some ways to reduce the overdetermined importance of race in the study of South Africa to something like uh, analytical size, uh, by which I mean to find those moments and those instances in South African history where race doesn't explain everything. Uh, to find those instances where race itself needs to be explained, uh, you know, its construction, uh, its making, uh, and the ways in which it becomes a common sense that binds uh, all South Africans black and white. Uh, and so this is what I'm trying to do. And some of it's, it's, it's a work that has concerned me for, for some time now, uh, the overdetermined nature uh, of race as an analytic uh, for South African history and historiography. And part of what I'm trying to do with this new project uh, called the Archive Machine is to challenge uh, the chronological construction of South African history, uh, to challenge the standard depictions of South African history, but to do that in ways that also raise bigger questions about the conventional uh, carving up of, South, of, of African history uh, more generally uh, between the pre-colonial, the colonial, and the post-colonial. And the trouble with this carving up, uh, you know, which is fairly standard in history departments, uh, not just in the US, uh, but in Africa too, uh, not to mention Europe, of course, uh, is that it ends up over-privileging uh, the colonial moment, which of course is in some ways the encounter uh, between Africa and Europe, right? Uh, a much more pronounced encounter. It doesn't start there, but it's much more pronounced uh, in the colonial period. Uh, and I have uh, in front of me here an image. This is a photo, uh, sorry, this is a, 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 a color drawing uh, that was uh, produced uh, by an artist named C.E. Tenner uh, in 1934. And this ran in publications uh, in, uh, in the UK, uh, in North America, and of course uh, in colonial, uh, you know, colonial Africa. Uh, and what this was, was a celebration uh, of the, the, the 24th uh, you know, uh, anniversary, uh, sorry, the 34th anniversary of uh, South Africa's founding as an independent country. And what is remarkable about this photograph is that it implicitly builds on this uh, conventional chronology uh, of what uh, you know, African history is, but also what specifically South African history is. Uh, and the way that this, uh, this, this photograph works, or the way that this image works rather, uh, is uh, that it actually assumes that South African history begins uh, at the Cape. Uh, so you can see Table Mountain in the background. Uh, it begins at the Cape. And in fact, the uh, artist himself, Turner, in explaining uh, the image starts with the Portuguese arrival uh, in 1488 or thereabouts uh, in this corner of Africa. Uh, and then you have uh, coming out of this, uh, this uh, in some ways almost literal unfolding of South African history from the Cape all the way uh, up to the north, right? And of course, uh, you know, implanted onto this is this idea that this is where civilization starts and this is when civilization starts. It starts with European arrival in the form of the Portuguese uh, and then just unfolds chronologically, uh, you know, thematically, uh, you know, all the way up to the north uh, until it envelops uh, pretty much all of Southern Africa. Uh, and so here you have all, uh, these objects that we might actually call the accoutrements of so-called modernity. Uh, you know, so you have, if you look to the left of the image, uh, you will see the uh, you know, a house that's built in the, sorry, this is to the right of the image. You'll see a house that's built in the Anglo Cape, I'm uh, sorry, in the Cape Dutch uh, style of architecture. And you'll see right in front of it, a padrao. And of course we know that as the Portuguese were making their way along the coast of Africa, they would, uh, you, know, uh, you know, plant uh, these padraos, these crosses uh, to mark their arrival 
level in these places. And then you also will see uh, the standards that are hoisted, uh, you know, starting with the Dutch standard. Uh, and then of course, uh, you know, Francis Drake, uh, you know, with the, uh, uh, with the, the cross, uh, and then you have uh, you know this series of uh, you know European settlers coming in, and of course in the background uh, you know caravels and ships, and then if you look up in the sky you'll see planes. Uh, so this is a conventional depiction of uh, South African history. Uh, this idea that South African history starts from the south, it starts in the Cape with the arrival of uh, Europeans, and actually moves upwards. Uh, and of course this has implications uh, for the political development uh, of South Africa. This becomes a basis upon which uh, you know white settlers root uh, their claim on uh, the territory that becomes South Africa in 1910, right? So this becomes the basis uh, upon which, uh, you know, justifications are offered for why South Africa should become, uh, you know, in Yatsma's words, a white man's country, right? This idea that this was barren land, this was empty land until uh, Europeans showed up and actually, you know, developed it, right? Gave it planes, gave it buildings, gave it ships, uh, you know, gave it telephony, uh, that, that sort of stuff. And so in the work that I'm trying to do, uh, uh, again, as part of this bigger project to in some ways cut race down to size uh, and of course uh, one last thing to say about this image you will notice that the only so-called natives in the in, in the photograph right uh, are these you know dark-skinned uh, you know uh, African warriors right and of course absent from the image uh, are the so-called uh, you know uh, Hottentots right uh, who were the in inhabitants uh, you know of uh, this region of South Africa when uh, you know uh, the Portuguese uh, first arrived so completely effaced, uh, you know, from the image, and what you have are uh, these two, uh, you know, traditional, uh, you know, <coughs> uh, you know, warriors who are, in fact, are paying homage to uh, the Salakan flag, uh, you know, under uh, apartheid, right? And so what I'm trying to do here, uh, in some ways, is to uh, challenge this conventional depiction of African history and South African history. Uh, you know, and there's a connection here, uh, I want to argue. And to do that in ways that actually allow us to take a step back uh, out of this usual periodization of African history and to look at what might happen if the history of South Africa specifically is understood not in these conventional terms where there's a pre-colonial mo colonial moment that is lost in some dark past somewhere, a colonial moment that has been contextualized and written down, and a post-colonial moment in the form of, uh, you know, the democratic South Africa. And the way that I do that is in some ways by starting from this uh, medieval site called Mapungubwe. This is in the northern part of South Africa on the border between South Africa and Rhodesia. Uh, so what used to be Rhodesia, uh, but, but is, now, uh, is now Zimbabwe, and what used to be uh, you know, Botswana land, but is also now Botswana. And to start there, and those of you who are familiar with this place will know that it's actually one of the most important archeological sites uh, in all of Af Africa, south of the Sahara. Uh, so for, you know, uh, uh, Favel, for example, uh, the cover of his book has the golden rhinoceros and that his book is titled The Golden Rhinoceros. And this is uh, one of the uh, you know, key relics uh, to come from the site. The site is also famous for uh, a massive collection of uh, you know, gold artifacts. Uh, and of course, it's also famous uh, for some of the earliest connections in this part of Africa with uh, you know, other parts of the world. And so you have here to the right of this image, uh, you know, Saladon fragments uh, that have been dated to the Song dynasty, uh, which, you know, they existed between 9, 960 and 1127. And so I'm going to stop the share there uh, uh, and just explain uh, you know, you know, what else I'm trying to do uh, you know, with this project. And so part of what I'm trying to do, as I was explaining to you, is to reduce the extent to which uh, analyses, historical analyses especially of South Africa, depend almost entirely on the centrality of race. Right? Depend almost entirely on race as that which explains everything. Except there never is a detailed examination of how race works. Uh, we know what apartheid did. We know what sort of laws it put into the books. Uh, you know, we know what these laws were designed to achieve, but we have no histories that help explain, for example, how white South Africans came to be white, how they came to see themselves as white. And this is important because uh, the white South Africa was not a monolithic, was not a culturally homogeneous group. It was made up of all kinds of streams. Uh, you know, some of them are coming from North Africa, for example. 
so how these people came to see themselves as white uh, and how that came to acquire a commonsensical status that might help us understand the workings of race and representation uh, is something that's yet to be explored. And so part of what I'm trying to do with this work is to do precisely this, to help us see the ways in which race worked, uh, but also the ways in which race was constructed as a common sense that bound both black and white. Uh, and I should also just mention just very quickly, and this will be my last point, uh, that I'm also doing this in ways that uh, are designed to upset the conventional accounts of apartheid uh, as a system of rule. Uh, the conventional accounts that depend on black victimhood uh, for the uh, sense. Uh, and I'm doing this by examining a group of white men uh, conscripted into the apartheid military uh, under apartheid and subjected uh, to all forms of abuse and torture on account of their being so-called socially deviant. Right? And we can talk about this in the Q&A. And so I want to try and uh, imagine and to see what South African history might look like when examined from the perspective of white South Africans, except not as uh, you know oppressors, not as abusers, but as themselves victims, right? I'm not writing another you know white uh, you know fragility story here, uh, but I'm trying to challenge these conventional depictions uh, you know of apartheid, uh, of what it means to be white, what it means to be black in the context of apartheid, but also to do that in ways that have this much bigger ambition, which is to ultimately challenge these conventional chronologies uh, that gave us uh, you know, African history and that also gave us uh, South African history. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Jacob. What an interesting way to begin. Your work has always challenged uh, the conventional wisdoms. And so I think we can all look forward to this. So thanks for starting us off with that, that really rich set of ideas. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Carol Phillips. Over to you, Cass. Okay, thanks, Stephen. Uh, first of all, I want to um, begin by saying thank you, of course, to the Institute for Holocaust, Genocide and Memory Studies um, for the invitation to take part in this roundtable and specifically to Stephen um, Klingman for reaching out to me. Um, I'm also very happy to be sharing the table with Jacob and Manisha, um, and I've been looking forward to what they both have to say on this subject. And the subject um, is race and representation. Obviously, everybody will approach this title, race and representation with their own personal and professional relationship to what is implied when race and representation are juxtaposed in this way. So let me um, begin by recalling something that happened to me over 25, 26 years or so ago when I was a professor um, at Amherst College, which is um, down the road from UMass, literally down the road. Um, one morning I was sitting in my office uh, behind my desk with the door open when I looked up and standing in the doorway uh, was a somewhat agitated young black student, a young man in a bow tie who was clearly keen to speak to me. Now I'd had actually the experience of a black man in a bow tie um, appearing in my office door before. Um, during uh, maybe a semester or two earlier, um, uh, the Amherst College had for some reason invited Louis Farrakhan to come and speak and uh, they positioned him in a hall in the English department and the Nation of Islam security, uh, the fruit of Islam decided to go around and basically harass those um, negligent, professors such as myself who decided that uh, it would make more sense to stay in my office and do some work rather than go upstairs to listen to Louis Farrakhan. So uh, a, a black man in a bow tie appearing at my office door um, was likely to set me on edge. Um, but in this case, it was clear that this particular young man was clearly keen to speak to me. So I beckoned him in 
and told him to take a seat. And this was actually probably about the last moment of civility that passed between us. He promptly asked me why I didn't make it my specific business to come and address the black students. I actually told him the following. I told him, A, um, the previous semester I had done just that. The black students at Amherst College had their own dorm on campus. And so one evening, I, uh, at their invitation, I'd shown up and shown them a film that I'd just made for the BBC that was with and about the singer Curtis Mayfield. And we did a Q&A afterwards that went on for quite some time. I also told him, B, that my job as a professor uh, was to be present and available for all the students, not just the black students. Well, that was pretty much like throwing oil on the fire and the indignant young man was certainly not going to be satisfied with such an answer. I tried to explain to him that while he couldn't expect professors to cater specifically to students who were from one racial group or another, there might well actually be questions, issues, on which certain professors might be able to better offer more insightful or nuanced advice. For instance, women professors might be able to better advise female students on some things, and yes, a black professor might be able to offer a useful insight into this or that situation for a black student. But the young man wasn't having any of this wishy-washy nonsense. My job, as he saw it and as he told me, was to represent. And by represent, he meant specifically black students. It soon became clear that this informal mid-morning conference was going nowhere. So I advised the student to vacate the chair, leave the office, and despite the evidence of the bow tie, not to bother me again until he'd learned some manners. Now, if we flash forward about 20 years, the story kind of continues. A few years ago, I was doing a panel discussion in New York with another writer. We were discussing James Baldwin's 1956 novel, Giovanni's Room, in front of an audience at Columbia University. At the dinner afterwards, our host somewhat tentatively broached the subject of his former partner, who'd been a student at Amherst College in the 90s. Did I, he asked me, remember a young man who one morning came to my office? I didn't. So he explained, and then I remembered, ah, yes, the bow tie. Well, he continued, I think that he still thinks the black professors should be there specifically to represent black students. I see, I said, and I asked the host who was black, what do you think? After all, we'd spend an evening at his invitation discussing a novel written by a black man in which there are absolutely no black characters. So how's that for representation? When Giovanni's Room was first published in 1956, Baldwin's audience were baffled not only by a novel which dealt so openly with the reality of homosexuality, but they were also confused, particularly black writers and critics were confused, as to why a black author would choose to write a novel in which there were no black people. My host thought about my question, what did he think? But he clearly felt torn. I sensed that some part of him, understandably, wanted to be loyal to the indignation of his former partner. But another part of him was ready to defend Baldwin, for after all, it was he, the host, who had chosen the novel under discussion and lavishly praised it in his introduction. Again, 
no question of representation there. As a writer, I'm clear about what my role is. It's to attempt to do what William Faulkner said in 1950 in his Nobel Prize speech. He said, uh, he actually summed it up, the job of the writer, as one in which the writer has to examine the human heart in conflict with itself. The human heart beats, of course, and societal and biological imperatives pull it one way or the other. Race, religion, sexuality, gender, class, all affect the human heart and determine its beat and its pulse, its openness, its ability to love, cherish or squander affection. But first there has to be some recognition that there is a heart and that heart in the beginning has no race. Literature cannot work if we discover identity politics before we identify the heart. And what do I mean by work? I mean, literature can't do its primary task, which is to remind us that we're all part of one family, the human family. That is why we can read Flaubert or Tolstoy or Neruda or Twain or Wolf or Achebe or Endo or Gordimer etc. and recognize ourselves. We read literature beyond nationality, beyond race, beyond gender, beyond class, for it begins with the heart. This is what Baldwin knew when he was writing Giovanni's Room, although at the time, many of his impatient critics and readers thought otherwise. As a teacher, or citizen of the world, there are going to be moments in which it's dangerous and sometimes irresponsible not to factor in my race in the same way that were I a woman, it would be dangerous or perhaps irresponsible not to, in certain situations, factor in my gender. There are some bars that one should think twice about before walking in, a uh, walking in alone. There are some roads it's perhaps best not to travel on late at night. There are some colleges one should think twice about before applying to them. There are no laws around these issues, just ever-changing guidelines which require a certain vigilance around variables relating to identity. The vigilance which can be aided by advice from others who have trodden the same path. Now, this is exactly what I was trying to tell the young man in my office. Calm down, you're at the right place, but you're presenting your case as a demand, as a right. And life is more nuanced than this, and Stalinism in a bow tie is still Stalinism. What I should have told him, of course, is to read. Read people like Baldwin or Toni Morrison and many others who know how to and when to represent where it came or comes to race, but who never lose sight of the primary primacy of the human heart in their work. As Toni Morrison once said, one of the great negatives focusing too much on race, which is often what they want you to do, is that it takes you away from your work. In other words, it's what she said, it's a distraction. However, not to factor in race at all can be irresponsible and dangerous. In other words, this whole business of race and representation seems to me to be a balancing act, which requires that word, I've already used it, vigilance. Or as the Norwegian novelist, Newt Hampson once termed it, it requires an eternally 
dominant vigilance, which is perhaps appropriate. Um, appropriate given our hosts today, but it's appropriate, I think, given the experience of European Jewry in the middle part of the 20th century. For the word, which seems to me to be the legacy of that experience, is vigilance. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kaz. Uh, stimulating and challenging as always. And for those who don't know Carol Phillips' work um, well, um, you are someone who's written about characters of all descriptions, male, female, black, white, um, and working through both the differences and the connections among them across time and space. Um, so, so thank you very, very much for that. Uh, we'll turn now to Manisha Sinha. Manisha, over to you. Um, thank you. Uh, I must thank the Institute and Dean Krauthammer, Professor Sconfino, Battle Baptiste, and Klingman for hosting us today. And of course, my fellow panelists and their cautionary remarks against uh, forms of racial essentialism, which I think is really important to talk about uh, when we speak about race and representation. Um, so I'm going to share my screen with you and I'm going to mainly talk about uh, my field uh, in Civil War history and how I have navigated the debates uh, especially the recent debates over Confederate monuments uh, and Civil War memory. Um, here is a place where I have found my academic interest to really coincide with assuming a more public role uh, in speaking about US history uh, as somebody who's of Indian American descent. So that always raises interesting questions uh, about representation and I have written about that quite a bit. Um, the first thing that I'd like to uh, sort of alert you to is the fact that most Civil War history uh, has been told in this country mainly through the lens of what we call lost cause mythology. Uh, and this is where memory, Southern white memory versus the actual history has collided. Uh, and it has had a really pernicious effect uh, in terms of a broader public understanding of the causes and the long afterlives of the histories of slavery and the Civil War in the United States. Um, so uh, to portray this as family memory or Southern uh, heritage uh, of uh, a region versus the actual histories of slavery in the war uh, have been really problematic. Uh, for many people, it is a uh, defense of uh, Southern states' rights for local self-government, uh, which sort of sanitizes uh, the cause uh, of the Confederacy, which was, of course, slavery. States' right to do what? Uh, it was mainly to perpetuate uh, and extend slavery. Uh, also, the notion of Southern honor, that somehow um, those who fought for the so-called lost cause were all honorable men. Of course, they're always honorable men, versus what uh, the great Black journalist Ida B. Wells uh, and civil rights activists called Southern horrors, uh, the realities of racial oppression under slavery and the long afterlives of slavery uh, in segregation and Jim Crow. And this is where I think we really do need to reckon with the violent overthrow of reconstruction immediately after the Civil War. Uh, it was a period that they sought to establish an interracial democracy uh, with black male citizenship. Um, and that was overthrown through a program of racial terror. Uh, and it is something that we still need to reckon with because when we saw the violent coup on January 6th, uh, many Americans were stunned uh, to see not just the battle flag of the Confederacy, but people taking matters in their own hands in, in literally invading the Capitol. Uh, this has of course happened before in Southern capitals all through uh, uh, the end of reconstruction. Uh, and it is something that we really need to talk about to understand our present. Uh, and just look at this particular period immediately after reconstruction, 
from at the turn of the 19th century, 1890 to 1920, when you had the establishment of a Jim Crow regime with a disenfranchisement of black men, sharecropping, debt peonage, convict lease labor systems that live on in um, systems of mass incarceration and the criminalization of blackness in the United States today. Um, and that was the reality of this period. But instead, uh, many Southerners, many white Southern elites in particular, wanted to talk more about a sanitized version of slavery with the myth of the faithful slave, of Blacks who presumably fought for the Confederacy. In fact, they fought for the Union Army during the Civil War. Uh, they did not participate in the Confederate war effort except as enslaved forced labor. And the people who were very uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, at the vanguard, at the forefront of perpetuating these myths about slavery and the war uh, were organizations like the United Daughters of the Confederacy, which was founded in 1894, precisely at the moment when you had the triumph of the Jim Crow system in the South. Um, you know, a few years later, you would get Plessy versus Ferguson, where the Supreme Court would give uh, judicial sort of recognition uh, to the separate but equal laws. Uh, they were really unequal, of course, as we know, uh, in practice of, of, of a system of elaborate racial segregation uh, that preceded South Africa's apartheid and the Nazi laws of race. Um, there were other groups like the Sons of the Confederate Veterans, etc. But it was really these white women who ended up uh, erecting many of the sort of monumental Confederate statues that have littered our public space since the late 19th century, uh, sending out a message of white supremacy, sending out a message of second class citizenship uh, for black people in this country. Uh, and it is a leg legacy that we are just uh, dealing with. Du Bois famously called it the propaganda of history. It was a Southern propaganda propagated by Confederate leaders like Jefferson Davis and Alexander Stevens, who were trying again to legitimize the Confed Confederacy uh, as a fight for constitutional principles, allegedly constitutional principles of states' rights. Uh, but even people like Milk Lewis Rutherford of the United Daughters of the Confederacy, who actually wrote textbooks history textbooks that were read by generations of Southern white politicians that perpetuated many of these pernicious myths. Uh, the tragedy is uh, that this became the kind of national understanding of the war uh, and of slavery. And it was dominated by Southern white historians like U.B. Phillips when it came to the history of slavery that portrayed slavery as a paternalistic uh, institution. The so-called Dunning School after William Dunning um, at Columbia University who uh, portrayed reconstruction as a period of uh, black misrule uh, of quote, big government uh, that had gone awry. Um, rather than looking at its achievements, including the establishment of a public school system for the first time in Southern history. And you had journalists who did their bit too on this, people like Walter Dean Hobble and um, Claude Bowers, famous journalists who perpetuated and popularized these kinds of uh, ideas about reconstruction. Uh, and all this was done, of course, in the heyday of scientific racism, of social Darwinism, uh, and in many cases, ironically, their writings uh, uh, ended up inspiring uh, rising fascists in Europe in the early 20th century. Uh, this was then popular culture uh, with, of course, the birth of a nation that glorified the Ku Klux Klan uh, based on Thomas Dixon's and famous novel, The Klansman, and inspired the rise of the second Ku Klux Klan in the United States in the early 20th century um, to Gone with the Wind, uh, which presented the Moonlight and Magnolia's myth uh, about slavery. Now, African Americans, of course, and their allies have always had an alternative memory in history of uh, the war. Uh, and you can see this in celebrations of emancipation, the day of Jubilee uh, and Juneteenth, oh, the day that emancipation was decreed by the Union General in Texas, one of the last places. Uh, where this happened, or in the Decoration Day where African Americans decorated the graves of Union Army veterans, uh, that lives on today as Memorial Day, 
Uh, I think uh, since we are in May and we'll be soon coming up on that holiday, it's important to remember that. Uh, and of course, looking at black veterans in the Union Army who constructed a counter memory of the Civil War uh, down to black civil rights activists. And I'm talking about the long civil rights movement, going back to the founding of the NAACP, the Niagara movement in the early 20th century, who developed their own commemorative culture where they would mark uh, the holidays and deaths of abolitionists like Garrison or Charles Sumner or John Brown, the fact uh, that the Niagara movement even met at Harpers Ferry was symbolic of them remembering uh, that alternative history. So there was always that history uh, that lived on in African-American folk memory, but also in African-American uh, histories and the early founding of um, uh, uh, Black history organizations, uh, Black public libraries uh, like the Schomburg. This emancipationist view of the war, of course, is symbolized in monuments that we don't normally talk about, like that to the all black 54th uh, um, regiment, Massachusetts regiment that you can still see in the Boston uh, um, uh, commons. Uh, and, you know, this, these are the monuments that we don't talk about much, but that are important, I think, for us to remember. Um, and uh, of course, the 54th has been glorified uh, in the movie Glory uh, more recently, but, um, but this memory of the war was always there. Unfortunately, the one that dominated uh, in uh, the United States was the reconciliationist memory of the war. Uh, and it really shows you how the North may have won the Civil War, but the South won the peace in determining the narrative. And that is why I think it's so important for historians today to intervene and unpack some of these really pernicious legacies uh, which showed a reunion of the white so South and white North, of course, on the bodies of literally on the bodies of black people, uh, because this is, of course, the heyday of lynching and racial terror uh, in the South. Um, this period, this turn of the century period, when this reconciliation took place and when these Confederate monuments went up long after the war was over. And in a way, those monuments were marking this victory of the South uh, in, in determining uh, the, the narrative of the war. Uh, some of these were pretty ugly, like the one in Stone Mountain that Stacey Abrams wanted to efface, and hopefully sh shall be. Uh, they were, in fact, monuments to treason and white supremacy. Um, as, uh, you know, a young student studying in South Carolina in the 1990s, I um, saw these monuments exactly the way the way they way, you know, most African Americans understood them to be, or the way most abolitionists or Union Army veterans saw them as. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, there was a huge debate about this in which most Civil War historians said, oh no, we don't need to get rid of this, we can just contextualize it. I was in the take them down side right from the side, uh, start. I, I found them um, horrifying to think about even uh, using public space and public monies to maintain uh, these monuments uh, were just awful. Uh, and hopefully uh, one should recognize exactly how pernicious it is because that stone mountain um, freeze that I showed you is exactly where the second Ku Klux Klan was born in the 1920s. The first was born, of course, uh, in uh, uh, the period of reconstruction and they unleashed uh, a reign of terror against uh, newly freed people uh, and their white allies uh, at that time. Uh, and one of them, of course, was this man whose uh, ugly statue suits, I think, his ugly reputation, historical reputation as a slave trader, uh, as a Confederate general who was responsible for the massacre of Black Union Army soldiers after they had surrendered at Fort Pillow, one of the worst war crimes of the Civil War, and was a founding member of the first Ku Klux Klan during Reconstruction uh, in 1866. Recently, his photograph, um, or his portrait, I should say, uh, in the Tennessee State, State Legislature uh, was put up for discussion uh, amongst um, uh, the governor and the state legislature there. And a historical commission recommended that his portrait be taken down precisely because who he was, it would be a bit like putting up a portrait of Hitler at the Bundestag today. Uh, and uh, this was a commission uh, commissioned by a Republican governor that had Republican members in it, but the state legislature has decided to overrule it. Uh, and they have decided to keep 
the portrait of Forrest. So these are not dead issues. They are still with us today and they are really um, symbols of real political harm when it comes to imagining our democracy. Um, I had written about this earlier, but I think I really got into the public sphere, into the debate about these monuments and Civil War memory uh, when the massacre took place in Charleston in 2015 summer by uh, Dylan Roof carrying again uh, 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 a Confederate battle flag uh, and making no bones about what he was up to. Uh, this was a black abolitionist church that I had written about extensively in my second book. Uh, and I wrote a piece on it for the Huffington Post that kind of went viral and was included in the Charleston syllabus. And then I wrote a number of other pieces talking about the pernicious legacies of uh, a, a Civil War denial. Um, the only good thing to come out of the Charleston massacre was uh, the initial movement to take down some of these monuments. This is when activists like Bree uh, Newsom went up uh, and tried to take down the Confederate battle flag from uh, uh, Columbia, South Carolina. You also had um, the mayor of uh, New Orleans, Mitch Landrieu, taking down Confederate monuments, uh, but also in Baltimore. But somehow the momentum for that stopped and, and there were a lot of people still, historians, academic historians, defending uh, these monuments, even though they are maintained by public taxes uh, that are levied on black and white citizens uh, today. Of course, the momentum changed also with the Unite the Right March, with the Chan Jews will not re replace us, uh, marching towards Robert E. Lee's uh, statue in Charlottesville, uh, where an assorted group of white supremacists, neo-Confederates and neo-Nazis got together, encouraged by Trump. Uh, again, I wrote a lot about that march and its fallout. Uh, and uh, you are welcome to, to look at these pieces. Uh, I, I really don't have the time to discuss this discuss it in as much depth as I would like to today. Uh, but I do want to, to argue uh, very strongly here that this is not some sort of um, preserving history uh, argument uh, in terms of preserving these Confederate monuments, because, you know, we write books uh, when we do history. We don't put up monuments, especially not these monumental 19th century style of monuments that tended to commemorate uh, sort of the great men in history, which is quite passe now, um, you know, presidents, generals, all with uh, uh, rather um, mixed legacies for us today. I am far more interested in the kinds of monuments that we are putting up today, whether it is the lynching memorial or the Holocaust memorial in Germany, the stumbling stones, the, um, you know, the Museum of African Amer American History that really does the kind of public history that we want citizens to be aware of and not these monuments that send out these pernicious messages of white supremacy. Um, interestingly enough, these ideas uh, soon have had an impact in public history. Uh, I, I really like this group of women uh, who are in the public history program in North Carolina St uh, State University. Um, like suffragists, you see their banners are like suffragists. Uh, they stand and they protest a Confederate monument, some of them that might seem quite innocuous to you, like this one of a Confederate woman, until you read a book that talks about how Confederate women traded in slaves and abused their slaves during the war in the home front, carrying out a war in the home front uh, while the war was taking place at the battlefront. Um, so um, the, the real tipping point for this, of course, comes uh, with the rise of the movement for Black Lives and George Floyd's murder. Uh, we know, of course, that this movement began much earlier with the murders of Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, Sandra Bland, uh, but it was a grassroots Black movement with a few white allies. I think what happened with George Floyd's murder is that it became this big interracial movement, mass movement in the United States where we saw you know, thousands of people taking to the streets in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, and then, of course, we saw it spread globally, internationally, uh, looking at the problems of police brutality, looking at the problems of the criminalization of blackness in Europe and the United States uh, in, in Western countries in general. So I think it has been an amazing moment 
uh, a, a moment of reckoning. Uh, and things happened that I never thought as a civil war historian would happen, which was the taking down of many of these uh, monumental style uh, sort of statues of Confederate generals and leaders, uh, Jefferson Davis, Stonewall Jackson, Robert E. Lee, they all came down at the from the capital of the Confederacy in Richmond. Uh, I think this, this was really iconic, this image of George Floyd projected on Robert E. Lee's a statue that really showed you the, the, the ways in which this activism, this movement uh, has finally led to uh, something that certainly I have been asking of over a long time and which now most Civil War historians also agree on, which is that these statues cannot be contextualized. They must come down. Um, one can think about other statues like George Washington or Thomas Jefferson or Lincoln, and I have argued that they need to be contextualized, right? Um, that we can do that when it comes to some of the, the founders, but with the Confederate statues, they have no redeeming quality to them. These were men who fought for human bondage and after the war uh, put into place a regime of white racial terror. The one that particularly gave me satisfaction was to see John C because I talked about him in my first book and I pretty much read everything he ever wrote and he wrote a lot, uh, was the taking down of John C Calhoun statue in Charleston, South Carolina. I thought it was symbolic because you can see the historic African Methodist Episcopal Church in the background. Um, Calhoun statue was put up on an 80 foot pedestal because black children would constantly deface his statue as they walked by because they knew exactly he was, who he was. Uh, Calhoun was known for pronouncing slavery to be a positive good uh, and then coming up with theories of secession that actually led to uh, the Civil War. Finally, the Confederate battle flag that was there in uh, the Mississippi flag came down. Again, a moment of extraordinary satisfaction for most Civil War historians who have always understood what that flag stood for. Now, after the Janu January 6th coup, uh, on uh, attempted coup on uh, the Capitol, um, I, I did start writing a lot again about how uh, we can think about having a third reconstruction, uh, about how we can meet new challenges, new threats to American democracy, which I think are as severe as that uh, which led to the overthrow of the first reconstruction uh, after the Civil War. Uh, but what was interesting in this moment for me was that I had always spoken as a Civil War historian, as a specialist. I tended not to be too reflective about my own identity as an Indian American, but more as a, a specialist in the field who had researched and written about this uh, for a very long time. But I found myself sort of going back uh, a little bit when it came to the elections uh, and prior. And this is when Donald Trump became president. And I started writing about Trump uh, in a way that I hadn't earlier, uh, you know, not from the sort of objective scholarly viewpoint, but I did see Trump as demeaning and as demonizing uh, people of African descent, immigrants, women, uh, people of color. Uh, and I had always shied from a kind of a simple identity politics because I think that is pernicious precisely for the kinds of reasons uh, that Jacob and Carol have laid out. Uh, but with Trump, I felt that it was really important for me to step in and make the argument both as a scholar, but also as an Indian American citizen, as an immigrant, as a woman uh, in this country. Uh, and eventually I wrote this piece, um, which was far more personal than anything I had ever written, uh, Why Kamala Harris Matters to Me, uh, which sort of went viral. Uh, and uh, it took me by surprise that it was that personal piece that seemed to resonate with people more than many of my other more scholarly pieces. Uh, so when it comes to thinking about race and representation, um, you know, like um, Carol and Jacob, I am, you know, very wary of those who would um, play simple identity politics or reduce, uh, think about race in essentialist ways. But at the same time, I think it is so important for this country, especially given this very fragile moment in our democracy, to really reckon with the past, to really reckon 
with the histories and the afterlives of slavery and the war. And I somehow feel now that not only do I have a scholarly stake in this, but also a personal one. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you so much, Manisha, for um, also for a, a third truly stimulating piece. Um, and um, it really strikes me, you know, I mean, I felt for, for quite some time, the civil war really never ended in this country and it clearly has continued in many ways. And also, and this is just a kind of a, um, a footnote to what you're saying. It, when I look at that statue of uh, Nathan Forrest, it feels to me that pretty much like socialist realism, there ought to be something called Confederate realism, you know, which is, it, it's stylized in its own way and, and quite bizarre. Um, and um, it's a little ugly, Stephen, and it is a lot like um, the hotel at UMass. We used to call it Hotel Bucharest, <laughs> you know, that slab of gray. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't even insult socialist realism with that. I would call it fascist kitsch art, but mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah. Um, anyway, I, I should say to everybody, I think, who, who's out there, and again, thanks for being with us, that uh, I think you can begin to submit questions on the, on the Q&A. But I, I wonder if I can just start things off um, among the three of you. Um, uh, it's just very interesting. I mean, Manisha, you were telling us all the reasons why we shouldn't forget race and the history of race in this country. Um, and Jacob, you began by talking about cutting race down to size. And you're also writing a book about white soldiers in the apartheid army, which is, you know, a very adventurous thing to do. Um, and, and Kaz, you've written, you know, characters who are certainly African. You've written, you have slave characters. The figure of Othello has been very important to you. Um, excuse me, but you've also written about... Um, white characters, about Jewish characters, about female characters, you've written, you know, first person narratives. And Manisha, you know, you, you're talking about how this has come around to be something being very personal for you as well. And you're someone who's, you know, born and grew up in India and you're writing African-American history. So I wonder if just the three among you can just reflect on some of that, you know, what you heard in one another's talks, what it means to cut race down to size while being vigilant. Um, I'll leave it at that. I mean, it just seems to me such interesting territory. You know, I, I don't like the term race too much because it is, it's, it's not a biological concept, right? The way people talk about it, it is, I, I, I would say, I, I prefer the term racism. Uh, and you talked about how you had discussed this in your seminar somewhat differently, but uh, I, I would say that I'm far more his, interested in the history of racism as an ideology. Uh, than I am about race as such, uh, even though I do talk about some of the pseudoscience of race at the turn of the century where people try to establish it as a, as, as a category to uh, both demarcate human beings and to understand our world. But I would let Jacob and Carol step into from their perspectives, how they feel. No, Jacob, you go. I mean, let me uh, let me essay an answer to, to Stephen's questions, and of course, I mean, thanks to to, to you know to both uh, Manisha and Carl for uh, these very thought provoking uh, you know observations about the workings of race and representation. Uh, so, so one of the uh, I think one of the difficulties I face in trying to make sense of what it was like to be white in South Africa. And then of course I use white in its official sense, right? Uh, because one of the most fascinating things about apartheid South Africa uh, was that despite its ideological commitment to white supremacy, and this was quite explicit. So, you know, when we call apartheid a white supremacist project, we're not using white supremacists as a slur, we're using it as a historical descriptor that, 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 that is accurate. Uh, but of course, what made apartheid live as long as it did, which was more than four decades, was precisely the fact that it was pragmatic, right? precisely the fact that in some ways it was open-ended. Right? Uh, so, you know, I mean, one of the most famous illustrations of this is the official uh, definition of a white person, right? So a white person was a person who looked white, uh, but more importantly was accepted by others as white, right? I mean, that was your definition of white, uh, you know, in South Africa. Uh, and of course, a lot of people, you know, took that on and, and it actually meant something, uh, you know, uh, for the obvious reason uh, that uh, this had implications for what kinds and what quality of public goods you could claim and you could have access to. 
right? So it's not just, you know, a whiteness as metaphor, but also whiteness as something real, as something lived. Uh, and so the challenge I face uh, in confronting not just the, 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 the pragmatic nature of the way in which race worked under apartheid uh, is the, 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 the depths, uh, you know, to which the idea of race uh, as common sense, uh, you know, went. So how far into the heads of the people I'm trying to write about, you know, do I go, can I go uh, in trying to make sense of this? And so that for me is actually one of the challenges, right? So uh, being alert to the openness of race in its operations, uh, being, uh, you know, alert to, uh, you know, being vigilant, right, to use uh, Carol's word, uh, about its operations, right, as a very pragmatic system of rule and, uh, and, and a way of life, uh, you know, while also understanding at the same time that the fact that this was constructed, uh, you know, doesn't blind us and shouldn't blind us to the fact that it had real material effect, right, that it meant something in a part in South Africa to be white. It meant something, uh, you know, but it's allowed officially to be black. And, and so this is what I'm grappling with. And as you can see, I'm not answering your question, Stephen, but uh, I'm, I'm just sharing with you uh, some of the, the, the problems I have. And I mean, there are moments when, you know, uh, in my more reckless moments, I wish I were a novelist, right? Uh, because in some ways I feel like, uh, you know, someone like Carl's was better equipped right, to, to handle this. And I mean, you've done this, right? And, you know, the nature of blood would be one good example of this, right? Uh, where you give us characters, right? Uh, who, you know, to go by a party definitions, right, would cut, would cut across the spectrum. Uh, but because I don't have that facility, I have to work with what I have in some ways. And what I have is actually very limited. Uh, so, so that's my answer and it's not an answer. But. Well, uh, it's actually a great answer, I think. And I don't think, I think you're doing yourself a disservice because I think you do have the facility. I wish I could kind of uh, record what you just said and play it to the students that I teach fiction to. Uh, about how to approach imagining themselves into the lives of people that are not them. Um, do so with a certain dignity, do so with a certain caution, but for heaven's sake, do so. Um, so I think you actually summed it up beautifully. So, um, and it's so, it, it's so um, wonderful to hear uh, two historians um, because I love history. I love history more than I love English. Sorry, Stephen. But, you know, history is a subject that, uh, as, as Eric Williams said, you know, it's the basic science as far as I'm concerned. It always has been. Um, but it, it's so wonderful to hear that kind of the, the way in which both of you spoke about these questions. But with, I guess, what I would obviously have been slightly biased, I would say with the with the sensitivity of people who are imagining and understanding that history contains within it self that word story and that it's deeply subjective. Uh, in terms of the, um, the monuments, I was fascinated by what Manisha was saying because I think one of those moments as an, as an outsider, and I suppose in, all, in some ways all of us are slightly outsiders. I mean, I certainly you know, came to this country um, for my... <laughs> to Amherst College in the 90s for one year, you know, look what happened. Um, so, so all of us have kind of tangential relationships, I suspect, um, to the United States of America, but listening to what Manisha was saying about um, the response specifically to the Confederate mo monuments really struck home to me because when my, when my first son was born, I had to go and get his birth certificate at Durham County Court, which is where there's a monument. I remember getting the birth certificate and then walking out and looking up at the Confederate soldiers monument to the boys who wear gray and thinking, hang on a second, what kind of narrative is inscribed in this place that I expect my little boy to grow up in? I feel deeply uncomfortable walking past this monument, but I, I'm equipped by virtue of education and travel and teachers that I, I respected who helped me along the way. I'm equipped to respond to this statue. What on earth is my son going to do? Who's, I'm holding his birth certificate when faced with that. Um, and that was a jolt. And one of those many jolts, I think, that those of us who have a, um, well, all of us should have, but those of us who certainly have arrived from outside who have a tangential and nuanced relationship with the history of the United States of America are faced with these issues, but the monuments and that monument in particular 
really struck me. And so I think the larger thing of what, what you were saying, Manisha, about these monuments, what they symbolize is so important. That monument came down in 2017 and boy, was I glad. Um, yeah. you I, know. I really appreciate your saying that, Carol, because, um, you know, uh, if you think about it, many Southern courthouses have Confederate monuments in front. Mm -hmm. And when we think today about the problems of mass incarceration, you know, and what Equal Justice Initiative has exposed in terms of systematic inequalities um, and discriminations against black people. So if you are a black person and you have a right to a fair trial and you walk into a courthouse and there are these monuments and portraits of Confederates, I mean, what do you think is the message, you know, going to them? And so I, I think we don't realize that a lot of this is in public property, that it is our taxes that support their maintenance uh, and that therefore they should be subject to some sort of democratic review mm -hmm. on how we treat these and, and just your reaction, you know, that that's, it's, it says the world, you know, it, it's not just uh, people of African descent, but now we are an increasingly diverse country people from all over, uh, what, what is the message that is being sent when you have something like that on state property, on government property? And as far as history is concerned, yeah, I think history is the activist muse. So I agree. So I know I've been pretty silent, but I'm going to interrupt here to um, bring forth some of our questions from the audience. Um, and this one is from Patricia uh, Martino Ferreira. Um, for Jacob, could you please talk a bit more about the kind of archive you are working with? That's a, yeah, so, so thanks Patricia for, for the great question. So, <laughs> so I, I'm working with oral histories, right? So I'm, I'm interviewing a group of men who in some ways were victimized uh, by uh, military psychiatrists within the South African Defense Force. Uh, so that's when, uh, you know, kind of uh, you know, resource I'm tapping into. But I'm also tapping into uh, official records, uh, you know, that have had to be in some ways wrested, uh, you know, from the clutches of the post apartheid bureaucracy. Because one of the great ironies about the new South Africa, you know, so-called, uh, is just how difficult it's been to access apartheid era records, right? And the gatekeepers have not been the old order, but the new order. That's actually one of the most fascinating things about contemporary South African history. And then I'm also working with uh, archaeological records uh, because one of the most, uh, I, I mean, I'll use this expression quite a bit, but a fascinating feature of the story I'm trying to tell is that this, uh, you know, archaeological site, uh, you know, that is world renowned becomes for a decade between 68 and 78 uh, becomes a military base. Uh, used by the apartheid military. And in fact, the apartheid military assumes ownership uh, you know, of the site and then leases uh, the, uh, the digs back to the University of Pretoria, which is conducting the digs. And so this is some of what I'm working with. I'm working with a range of sources, uh, you know, archeological, oral, uh, you know, documentary, uh, uh, you know, textual, uh, and, and I'm trying to put it all together, uh, you know, as a way of uh, reimagining what uh, a different chronology of South African history might look like. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, this next question is for Carol. Um, could you please speak to the importance of representation um, in your own life as a youngster and how it impacted your focus on writing? And that is from um, Emily Evans. Okay, um, thank you, Emily, for the question. Uh, to be honest, I mean, um, I, I grew up in England. I, you know, I went to school in England at a time when English history um, didn't really contain narratives about people like myself. Um, and when we were included in the narrative, it wasn't a particularly happy story. Um, and, you know, a five-year-old kid could tell that yeah, that's not exactly representative, representative of what um, I suspect my story is a little bit more complex than that. Let's just put it that way. Um, so um, who did I depend upon to counter these narratives, not having any black teachers? Um, 
ironically, um, but appropriately, you know, the teachers that were the most important to me, the two teachers, one of whom was a Holocaust survivor, my history teacher, uh, Mr. Stern, who obviously saw something in this young black kid in the classroom uh, who loved history. Um, and he understood something about the mutability of history and the way it can be twisted and presented. And I think he was probably sensitive to the way in which English colonial history was being presented um, or British colonial history to this young black kid. So he was an incredible influence on me. And barely a week goes by when I don't think about him. Um, and then of course, like most people who become writers, there's the English teacher who encourages you to write. Um, and I had one of those too. Um, but it, it's, it's, it's the importance of being a teacher, I think, without trammeling oneself into the, the, the straitjacket of identity politics. That's why my response to that young student who came to me was very much, please, don't impose that upon what we do, because um, you will be, uh, you will, or you could perhaps, um, understand by talking to a black teacher be it myself or somebody else you know one basic lesson you don't have to kick every barking dog down the road that you're about to walk in your life or you'll never get there i could tell you which dogs to kick and which not to however there are other teachers who are not black who can also help you so don't trample teachers into a straitjacket of identity politics because it will work against you there are plenty of teachers out there like i had who didn't look like me but without them, I wouldn't have become um, whatever it is I've become. Thank you. Um, this question is for Manisha. This is from um, Shweta Chandrashikar. I hope I did not uh, batter your name, so sorry. Um, in the Indian context, the right-wing Hindu nationalists have begun to justify the demolition of Bab Babri Mosque by using the abolitionist and fallist rhetoric. How can we think about such neo-fascist appropriations of abolition and fallism? Uh, that's a very interesting question, Shweta, because we know, of course, uh, throughout history, and I, I don't like to talk transhistorically, but you know, you go back to the Vandals and <laughs> invasions in Rome, and you go back to the way the Christians dealt with heathen statues, uh, you know, destroying monuments, destroying statues, burning libraries. You know, we have a very long and sorry history of it throughout the globe. Um, and I think it's a bit of a travesty for the mob that destroyed the Barbary Masjid, which took place, you know, decades ago, um, to, to even sort of compare what happened um, to what is happening in terms of taking down Confederate monuments. Uh, a lot of them have been taken down uh, through, you know, by mayors and by a democratic discussion by city councils and local governments. The mob that took down Barbary Masjid, Masjid is a lot like the Taliban that destroyed the Bamiyan statues in Afghanistan. Um, these uh, guys are religious fundamentalists. They are uh, they practice the worst kind of identity politics, which is to weaponize religion um, to carry out their purposes. And we have our own version uh, of that in the United States. Um, you see the appalling rise of anti-Semitism because of that kind of fundamentalist uh, Christian view that you, one wouldn't think, you know, Nazism kind of made racism unfashionable in the Western world, but now suddenly it has crept up with uh, an alarming propensity. So it's, it's, it's something that historians are very well aware of. I would certainly not compare that uh, to, um, uh, to, the, to the very sort of long drawn out process of taking down these Confederate statues and having these discussions about this um, in the United States. Um, certainly, I think uh, the right wing Hindu fundamentalists uh, and Modi are far more like uh, these populist authoritarian leaders like Trump 
uh, like uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil, like Viktor Orban in Hungary, who try to use uh, structures of democracy to actually undermine democracy. And oddly enough, that is exactly what Hitler and Mussolini did too. Um, and so I, I think that is the apt comparison, the apt analogy, if we were to make one uh, between what is happening um, with the way in which Modi um, has systematically undermined democratic institutions in India. It is exactly what Trump did here. And Trump, in fact, defended the statues, right? He said, they're beautiful statues. We want to keep them, these lovely symbols uh, to white supremacy. And I'm using, again, white supremacy uh, exactly the way Jacob did to actually describe a regime of white supremacy in the South. Uh, which, as John Sell wrote a long time ago in, in the highest stages of white supremacy, did this wonderful comparative work. You're probably familiar with it, Jacob. I read it as a grad student. <laughs> the comparison between South, uh, South Africa and Jim Crow um, uh, South, uh, and recently uh, Hitler's American models, um, that the book that looks at how Hitler was inspired by the Confederate experiment and by the conquest of the West. Uh, so these are global histories and there are a lot of connections, but not the ones that the Hindu fundamentalists in, in India uh, want to draw. Um, those are the kinds of connections I would alert you to. Um, I find what they have done uh, in terms of attacking uh, the secular nature of our constitution to be appalling. Uh, what we don't want is India to become a theocratic state because it has, this has always been an extremely diverse population and that is what we have always prided ourselves to be. Let's see uh, if the current completely catastrophic failure of the Modi government to deal with the pandemic uh, will bring him down the way it brought down Trump uh, in this country. It's too, still too early to say um, the good news is that they lost the elections, the regional elections, and hopefully they will, the national one too. I, um, this question, this next question um, from Jin uh, Young Moon is, it's geared for, toward Manisha, but I think yeah, it you know, also, yeah, mm -hmm. um, so I have a uh, um, Gandhi, the Gandhi statue was demolished in Ghana in 2018. This was after a book, the South African Gandhi, Stretcher Bearer of Empire, excuse me, published in 2015, that said Gandhi was an anti-Black racist, um, was an anti-Black racist. Um, and my question is whether the method of removing the statue from the civil society memory space brings the correct memory culture. Yeah. That's a great question. I'll quickly answer it and I'll hand it over to Jacob. Uh, I know that, you know, in the African context, it's really been roads must fall, uh, both in South Africa and in Britain, where that has been a, a, a point of controversy. I think the taking down of the Gandhi statue in Ghana was really unfortunate because it was based on bad history. Mm. Um, the, um, you know, it, it's really important, I think, uh, for people to understand uh, the exact historical context of Gandhi's South Africa campaign. Uh, and, and that book is, uh, you know, it reminds me a lot of Eric Erickson's book. It is uh, based on isolated sort of uh, facts that, are, that that person blew up to make a case that Gandhi was an inveterate racist. Uh, and in fact, uh, I would recommend Ramchandra Guha's biography of Gandhi that looks really at detail in Ga on Gandhi's South African years and his own coming to terms with his own paternalism, his own racialism. Um, and I think that's the way we need to look at it because I have been dealing with this in terms of people who want to take down Lincoln statues and have come out completely against it as a civil war historian, because um, one really does need to contextualize those statues, maybe deal with some of the uh, isolated sayings and then look at the trajectory of the person. Uh, to me, it's far more important that Gandhi acted as an inspiration for um, Nelson Mandela, for Dr. King, um, for President Obama. Uh, and so, you know, the, the legacies can't be confined in this sort of, um, sometimes, you know, uh, 
an isolated look at something that can be easily, uh, you know, uh, argued uh, against by historians and which has been done uh, quite well. Um, so I would really look at Guha's response to that book, um, to the stretcher, because I think that is a bit of a, uh, the ways in which we like to tear down our, our figures. I mean, we've seen that happen with Dr. King recently. We've seen that happen with, um, you know, people arguing that, uh, you know, can African-Americans be racist against, you know, uh, uh, adopt dominant white racial attitudes? Uh, and I think we really need to be careful there. We, we do need to look at the historical context and we do need to unpack it. And that's why I tend not to talk too much in terms of white versus black, because it never falls like that. When I write about abolitionists, there were black abolitionists, there were white abolitionists. When I talk about, you know, people who were Confederates, uh, there were, you know, white Southerners who uh, opposed the Confederacy. They were a minority, but they were there. So you can't just say the white South or you have to use the correct term. And this is what I am really particular when I talk to my students, be very specific how you talk about uh, either a historical figure or a particular moment in history and do not adopt these blanket terms. You know, uh, I think when you say things like whites or blacks, it makes no sense uh, unless you're a white supremacist, you know, then you can, say that you're in, you know, I had no direct descendants of Anglo-Saxons. Uh, but yeah, I think it's really important to look at the particular South African context, the divide and rule, the, the way in which the Indian community first tried to separate itself, then try to make a common cause, get into that very, to the nitty gritties, you know, that very complex historical story before you say, aha, this guy was a racist, this guy wasn't. You know, I'm, I'm much more interested in looking at the actual historical legacies and policies. What does that mean, you know? Uh, what does it mean to be a, a person who subscribes to, to Jim Crow laws and wants them enacted versus somebody like Albion Touche who is white and who opposes them, but can be paternalistic at times when talking about black people? there's a difference there. And I think it is important for us to unpack those historical complexities rather than talk about it in, in blanket terms, especially when it comes to race because it is so charged. Can I, ask, I know Jacob's going to speak. Can I just ask a quick follow, whatever the term is in response to that? Um, Manisha, what's bad history? Bad history is mythic history, not based on evidence. <laughs> so, you know, you have fake news, you have a lot of fake history running around in the United States, right? Um, bad history would be, um, uh, for instance, defending a Confederate statue and not looking at the speech that was made when that statue was erected. Um, so even with my students, I don't particularly want them to adopt a certain interpretation. What I do want them to do is back up their arguments with sources and evidence. So if you're going to concoct a story that has, you know, no basis in any evidence, that's bad history. You could say something that is contradicting my interpretation right now, for instance, but if you have sufficient uh, evidence and sources to back up your argument, I will listen to you. I may still disagree with you. But what's really bad history is really mythology, when you make up stories, uh, myths uh, that have no basis in, in reality and no ba basis in evidence. So history is like, you know, we are like straddle the social sciences and the humanities. You know, we like to write well, or at least we pretend we write well. We don't write as well as you do, Carol. But we, we do want to base our work on evidence, on sources. So, just to make up something would be historical fiction or bad history, but to actually, in fact, the best of historical fiction actually pays a lot of attention to history too. But, um, you know, that, that to me is bad history. I mean, I, and, and, and it's bad history also because it can be, it's harmful, it's pernicious. It is like Hitler saying, we are descendants of Aryans, you know, what, which Aryans, you know, the, 
the tribal people in the Caucasus Mountains that you know said centuries ago that's bad history also because because it, it involves so much political harm and and that's why you know scientists today say we have to fight against people who don't believe in evolution people who don't believe in and I think as historians today we actually have to fight against that kind of bad history too because it leads to people believing in all kinds of fantasies about the past uh, that wants them to quote, make America great again, that has no basis in historical reality, right? Um, so to me, yeah, that would be it. But I'm gonna hand over the floor to Jacob because I'm sure he wants to say something about this from the South African perspective. Thank you. Yeah, so I mean, this is a, this is a bit tricky uh, because I, I should also confess that uh, you know, I, I happen to know uh, Ashwin Desai, Gulam Vahed, and rate them quite highly, but also know Rem Guha and I rate him uh, very, very, very highly. So, so I, I, I should just, you know, put that disclaimer out there. So, so one of the uh, uh, texts I like to teach uh, in my class on colonial and post-colonial Africa is a speech uh, given in 2011, uh, sorry, in, in 1911 by a man named John Dube. Uh, so John Dube was an acolyte of Booker T. Washington. He was the first president of the ANC. He was the first ancestor that Mandela addressed, uh, literally after voting for the first time in 1994. Uh, so a fairly significant figure uh, in South African history. And it's a speech in which uh, you know, uh, Dube is giving the keynote address. And this is the 70, so this is 1911. And it's the 75th anniversary of U.S. missionary activity in what is colonial Natal. And Dube is in some ways the, the, the exemplar, but also the product of, of this, this missionary activity. Uh, you, know, you know, not really a graduate of Oberlin, but you know, spent time at Oberlin College, uh, you know, with support from U.S. missionaries. Spent time in the U.S., you know, has met with, uh, you, know, uh, you know, Booker T. Washington and then some of these other figures. And it's a... a it's a very troubling speech uh, because he's lauding a missionary activity, but he's also saying some very awful, awful things about so-called heathens. Yeah, he's saying some very, very terrible things about uh, you know fellow Zulu speakers in this region, uh, you know, of South Africa. Uh, so just to give an illustration, so one of the things he says, for example, he was uh, it said, uh, "We have to praise the missionaries for introducing rectangular type housing." to this part of Africa, because what this means is that suddenly we can build houses with windows, houses with doors that open and shut, which means that the light of God can come in, right? Uh, up until the missionaries showed up, you know, Africans would actually basically become reptiles, like to walk in and out of the, of, of the houses. So it's a very troubling, uh, but also very racist speech. I mean, let's call it what it is. And so I, I give this to, to, to students. Uh, and, and of course, John Dube was neighbors with Gandhi, right? They lived uh, in, in the Inlander Valley, uh, hated each other. They hated each other. Uh, both read newspapers, worked together sometimes, uh, but hated each other. And a lot of that animus had to do with race, right? A lot of it had to do with race. Uh, Gandhi did disdain Africans, right? And Gandhi did have some awful things to say about Africans, right? Dube did disdain Indians and had some pretty awful things to say about, you know, about Indians, right? And I think this is an important part of the history, right? But I think what I agree with Manisha is that uh, Gandhi does grow, right? Uh, Gandhi does grow, Gandhi does change, Gandhi does develop, right? And that we need to acknowledge this, right? Uh, but also, you know, will in my teaching make the argument uh, to students that of course it's important to recognize complexity but that complexity on its own is not an argument, right? In some ways to say that things are complex is to state the obvious, right? And that what we have to do as scholars, as thinkers is to take it beyond that, right? To show why the complexity matters, uh, why it's significant. And more importantly, to show what comes beyond or what comes after complexity, right? Uh, so so this is, this is you know, some of what uh, some of what I do because I myself have had to contend with the meaning of Gandhi for South African history, right? The meaning of Gandhi for African history. And of course, I will agree with, with Manisha that I don't think that uh, Gandhi's, uh, you know, statues in, Johann in Johannesburg and Durban, for example, should be torn down. Because uh, I think there's a case to be made here that these can be contextualized in ways that some of these other monuments can actually not be contextualized, cannot be redeemed. Uh, and so I think that's a, that's an important point to make. Uh, and the last thing I'd say about about some about Gandhi 
uh, not the figure, but Gandhi the symbol, uh, is that he helps us see something quite important in Afghan nationalism as it developed in Southern Africa. Because what defines Afghan nationalism in Southern Africa is this very studied uh, disdain, if I may use that word again, for race, right, as that which anchors one's identity, right, uh, what makes the kind of nationalism that Mandela pursues, for example, right, is, is, is a studied refusal to nativize, uh, you know, who belongs where and what, right, so, you know, the most famous charter uh, that the ANC produces in 55, for example, uh, the Freedom Charter, you know, has a preamble that says South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white, Right. Uh, but because we've uh, in some ways refused to see this nationalism for its exceptionalism, right? we've refused to see this nationalism for its refusal to racialize itself, right? we have missed a lot of this. Uh, and I think this is important. And it's important in large part because African nationalists, broadly defined, had to contend, but also had to come to terms with the fact that uh, South Africa was made up of people of Indian descent, was made up of people of mixed descent, was made up of Euro you know, people of European descent. And that if you had to fashion a new country, you had to put all this together. Right? And putting all this together meant, you know, asserting as a statement of fact that this country belongs to all who live in it, black and white. And of course, white here, I'm sorry, black here, used in its capacious term uh, to, 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 to mean both people of African descent, people of Indian descent, and people of mixed descent. Uh, so this is important uh, because I think you understand that only if you appreciate the importance of Gandhi to South African history. And that that's such a uh, uh, that's such a great insight, Jacob. You know, when you actually have to teach and you have to deal with that histories, that's when you sort of go beyond the 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 quick conclusions, right? And you know, I think the problem in the U.S. has always been that we've never had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission the way South Africa had, right? I mean, I don't know what the effect was of that. Whether you feel that that was beneficial, I'd like you to speak about it, but. I really think this country has never really reckoned with the history of slavery and, and racism uh, in, in Jim Crow South, um, the way that South Africa was forced to politically deal precisely because you were creating an interracial democracy. I think in America, people just assume that we are an interracial democracy. And when these awful things happen, everyone sort of you know looks back at it. And so if you look at, the controversy, let's say, over the 1619 project here, right? You know, that a bunch of journalists get together in the New York Times to, to talk about history and, and bring that out to a broader public because they feel the urgency to do that is because we've not had any mandated uh, uh, sort of reckoning with that. Uh, and what has happened has been um, the, this sort of dominant Southern white imagery that has triumphed. Uh, both in popular culture and then initially in academia, uh, right up to the Second World War. And that that is something that I think we are still contending with today in a way that perhaps in South Africa, I, I think people are looking much beyond that now. But in the US, even that initial conversation has not happened. I have um, from Madeline Andrews, and um, I'm going to ask this question because it is give, it's for all of you to potentially answer. Um, do you think it's possible, given the long history of the, um, quote, racism ideology, as um, Manisha si uh, Sinha said, do you think it is possible for total deconstruction of race? Interpret that however you can. And to what extent or fields, historiographical, literary, et cetera? So I, the de deconstruction of race completely. All right. No, <laughs> no, that's not gonna happen. Uh, it can get better. And, you know, the evidence of it getting better is contained in this webinar, you know, people doing the work that they're doing, uh, scholars, writers, activists, teachers, doing the work that they're doing. It. We have to believe it's going to get better um, because that's why we're working in our different fields. But will there be, you know, will there be eradication? No, human beings 
uh, both, let's, let me put it politely, both too forgetful um, and too myopic to, to, to ever parade through their three score years and 10 without being swayed by pernicious opinions, political, social, or otherwise. So, you know, what we do is a vanguard against that, um, that, that, that kind of uh, toxicity, which is bound to be present because that's the nature of who we are as human beings. Uh, but will it be eradicated? I don't think so. Will it get better? Yeah. I mean, I loved what Jacob had to say about, you know, Gandhi's growth um, and the redemptive quality. I mean, these are important words that can be applied to us as a collective. Um, we will grow um, and there will be some redemption and we're not going to have to always turn on our TV and see some bonehead in a red hat with 45 on the side of it. That is not going to be our legacy. Um, we will grow. We will deal with that. So anyway, that's my um, unnuanced opinion um, to that great question. I, I wonder if I can jump in here um, because I recognize uh, Maddie Andrews, who was in my class this semester. So thanks so much for that question, Maddie. Um, and um, I had, you know, I wrote a book on Bram Fisher, who was a white Afrikaner who, um, you know, turned from African nationalism, joined the Communist Party and became a comrade of Nelson Mandela and all those other people. And um, I had the good fortune on one of the most amazing days of my life to interview Nelson Mandela about Bram Fisher. And what Mandela said, because he was an honest person, was, you know, when I started out, as a convinced African nationalist, I didn't want anything to do with white South Africans or Indian South Africans or, you know, anybody from elsewhere in the world because we felt that these were foreigners who were bringing foreign ideologies into the country and oppressing us. He said, but it was when I saw that people like Fisher, like Ruth First, like Yusuf Dadu and a whole host of other people were prepared to take the same risks that we took and were prepared to work with us, that I changed my mind in the words that Jacob used and that Kaz has reinforced. In other words, he was prepared to grow. That was, you know, Mandela being prepared to, to grow and to change. My, my point there is that Fisher was also someone who's prepared to grow and to change, growing out of Africana nationalism. Um, and so it feels to me, identity is not a thing. It's a process. It's a process and it's a relational process. It's always relational. And what matters is not so much who you are, what you are, who you are, what you are, that's a bit of a mystery, you know? And it's always gonna change. What matters is who you're prepared to connect with and what you're prepared to do in the space between people and among people. And it feels to me, that's what fiction writers do. It feels to me, that's what historians do. Whitney, that's what anthropologists do. You know, I mean, I feel that that's, that's the testing ground of who and who we are and what we can become. It's not so much who we are, but what can we become? And we do that in relation to other people. I mean, that's, uh, you know, fairly deeply held belief on my part. So that, you know, when we're talking about race and representation, um, race is a process. It's, um, it's about racialization. It's about how race is produced and reproduce them, but also how it can change. And, and I think things really only change in, in that very difficult territory sometimes between and across and among people. Yeah, you know, if I can jump in there a little bit, I think that's an excellent question, Maddie, because, um, you know, I came across this not just as a sort of a theoretical idea, right? Uh, I was studying black abolitionists and it was fascinating the debates that they were having about how to conduct their activism uh, in an interracial movement uh, and how to use racial categories or whether they should completely dispense with it. Uh, because they were dealing with the initial rise of the pseudoscience of race in the 19th century, they insisted on talking just about the human race and human rights. They felt that every time they used racial terms or racially conscious terms, they were somehow uh, reinforcing 
uh, that dominant racist ideology in the United States that was being born just then, right? It was being codified in the laws, white men were being enfranchised, black men were being disenfranchised, um, you know, all those things, you know, creating the sort of lily white uh, slaveholding republic. And uh, I love their debates because instead of telling my students how I thought about it, I actually got them to read Henry Hyde and Garnet, Frederick Douglass, you know, William Whipper. And, and there were some who like Samuel Cornish said that, you know, we are oppressed as, as a race. So we have to use those categories in order to fight against racism. But these were deeply political and intellectual debates and they were so theoretically sophisticated. You know, we, we think about the past. We don't think that those people had any ideas that we've had, but they were, they were debating this at a very conscious level. So I would literally get them to read that. And that's what I meant when I said that we need to talk about racism and, as an ideology, because they were really, they were very attuned to how pernicious racism can be in terms of defining and categorizing people and then you know having policy outcomes in terms of denying them the vote or access to skilled jobs or access to education even so you know it was for me that was very eye opening and then they had debates even over monikers are we africans are we black americans are we colored americans then the naming debate was a huge debate amongst Black intellectuals and Black activists going right back to the early Republic, to the 18th century. Um, and so with, with this book that I wrote, Abolition, I felt, found myself going back and back and that suddenly I was in early modern Europe because there were Africans there who were talking about this too. Uh, so it's, it's, it's an old story. And I just think that it's really important for us to, you know, of course, as a historian, I'm gonna say this, to be aware of the history of some of these debates. Yeah. And if, if I may follow what Manisha just said, uh, and of course, this is something dangerous, right? but I do find solace uh, in history, right? uh, by which I mean the past. Uh, and so I've been working on a, what's become a bit of a stalled project, uh, but working with archival material uh, from the South African police archive, uh, reading informer reports. So these are, are black informants, black informers, uh, you know, black police officers working undercover. Uh, you know, reporting on the Gaviate movement in South Africa, reporting on the ANC, uh, you know, Mandela's uh, movement before, you know, he, he joins it. Uh, and uh, of course, the, the, the religious idiom is, so, idiom is so pronounced, right, in these reports, uh, because these uh, informants and informers are taking some of the stuff verbatim, right, you know, they're writing these reports and capturing verbatim what people are saying, and the use of, uh, you know, Judas Iscariot, right, as a slur. Right, that you are Judas and you, you know, you becoming a Judas is quite instructive because what it says to me, uh, you know, in reading these reports, uh, is that what is being worked out here right, is not, you know, who's a Judas and who's not a Judas, but but what it means to be black, right? So so to echo what Manish is saying, that what these what these reports are showing us is is the process by which uh, uh, what it meant to be black as a political category. Right, uh, you know, was being contested, was being fought over, uh, but also was being shaped. Uh, so that, uh, you know, come the 1950s, right, you know, being black in South Africa, you know, means something, right? It means something that makes it much more uh, sensible to denounce somebody as a Judas Iscariot, right? Because then that somebody is letting down the side. Whereas, you know, in the first half of the 20th century, it's not quite clear what the side is, right? Uh, so we sit here, we look back, and so of course we know what the side was, like it was the black side, right? Uh, but you read this report and you realize that actually, no, uh, you know, what the side was, was not obvious right, to the actors themselves, right? It wasn't clear. Uh, and what we can do uh, sitting here looking back is actually make sense of what it is these people are trying to figure out, right? Uh, what it meant to be black, you know, what it meant to think of blackness as a political category in opposition to whiteness as a political category, right? So I think that is uh, for me a source of hope and solace. Uh, the realization that, uh, you know, within in some ways this lifetime that people are trying to work out these issues and to work out what it meant to be black, what it meant to be white, means that we can also move forward, right, uh, to echo, you know, what, what Carol was saying, uh, and imagine a better future, right? not a perfect future, but a better future, uh, you know, where race is, is a lot less, uh, you know, potent, uh, a lot less potent than it is now. So, uh, 
I apologize. There was another question from Emily Evans and uh, Toussaint Lossier, and we unfortunately have run out of time because I really value everyone's time on this on this end of week um, Saturday. Um, I just wanted to thank all of you for joining us and having this very important discussion right now. Um, I I start out as a historian and then I um, went to become a historical archaeologist. So I really appreciate hearing, constantly hearing the words of excavation and archaeology because the two things I, I really appreciate are excavations, but most but now as I get older, the excavation of the archive is much more appealing than excavations in dirt because I'm I'm older. Um, so I just want to um, thank you all because although these, although the, 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 the work and the words that you shared with us are not in the same field or in the same area, but the ideas that we wanted to put forth for this year's seminar was about race and representation. And I, um, along with Stephen and Alon, thank you all because this has been the perfect culmination of, of an incredible year of, of just learning and understanding. Um, I would say post George Floyd, but I would now say post um, Chauvin trial, because now the real question comes, um, as soon as we got the verdict, the, the state continues to um, murder. And that's, that's, there's, there's no other um, uh, positive word to say about that. But I do think that we now understand globally what's happening in Colombia, what's happening under Bolsonaro, what's happening across the globe, our abilities to have conversations across the pond in the UK, but as well as South Africa. And, and learning from history and understanding that monuments have a variety of meanings uh, across cultures. And that representation brings us into more nuanced conversations about the role of race and the centrality of it and how um, it should not be as central as it, ha as it has become. And I uh, really especially appreciate Jacob's ideas about the ways in which the colonial moment has been the highlight. And we need to not only expand our discussions of race, but also expand our discussions about time and, and the past. And, and, and as Manisha warns us to look out for that uh, bad history that um, is still out there and still coming out there. Um, so I just wanted to ask if Alon or Steven had any other parting words. I appreciate the ability for Jacob to, to, to um, uh, finish with a hopeful note and not a note of despair. No, it was hopeful. Thank you. <laughs> so I wanted to open it up for Stephen and Alon if you had anything else to um, add to our goodbyes. Well, if I may quickly, Whitney, say goodbye to all of you, but I do want to address something that Tusan brought up. Okay. It is, you know, where he said that, what did you do with the death threats that you got when you started writing about Trump? I think that's when I realized that however much I had my scholarly objective pulls, that I was viewed in a certain way by certain people that made me get, uh, find out that this one guy in Texas basically wanted to kill me. And, uh, you know, why I got security pr protection when I went to Texas to do lectures. So, you're right, uh, Tussad. I'm glad you reminded me of that because it was before I, uh, and it didn't stop me from writing. Uh, my husband, who's German, says that's the, what they want to do. They want you to stop speaking and you've got to continue speaking. So I just wanted to address that mainly because Tussant and I were colleagues in Afroam at UMass, and I didn't want his question to go on and address. Thank you. I, I tried to apologize. I didn't know if I That's wanted to. I know. <laughs> it's okay, Whitney. I just read it on my own and I was like, hi to Sant. Um, and so I'll, I'll be quiet and thank everyone and let you all do the wrap up. <laughs> uh, 
So I don't have too much to, to add. I'll leave it to Alon uh, if he wants to say a few words, but I just want to echo what Whitney has said, just to thank our three speakers, both for your presentations and this remarkable discussion, which I found totally invigorating. And if there is hope, uh, I think as, as Carol Phillips said, it comes, it comes from events like this, not only from events like this, there are political movements out there, there are other things to do, but events like this really have their place. And it uh, reinforces my feeling that, um, you know, far from being just academic discourse, what we do here actually does matter, it does make a difference, and it's very, very important. So um, thanks to our speakers for reminding us of that. Thank you, Whitney, for, for a wonderful year together running this, uh, this uh, seminar. Thanks to our seminar participants who've been great all the way through this year. And thanks to Alon for giving us the time and space uh, to do it. So Alon, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Manisha, Jacob, and Carol. It was an inspiring, uh, an inspiring conversation. And Jacob put it well that there is a solace in history, and partly there is solace because there is also the mystery of the past. There is something about the past that always remains mysterious, and this I think links history, which aims to tell a truthful story about the past and literature which takes its own, uh, its, its own liberties with how to tell the stories. And this, this link, I think, makes both literature and history a source of hope. And uh, your discussion was beautiful because it reminds us that uh, these stories that we tell ourselves, whether they are historical or literary, they have an ethical uh, dimension and they should have an ethical uh, dimension. Uh, if we want to have uh, a better a better world, whether it is in in the U.S., in Britain, in India, in Israel, in Palestine, or wherever we want to do it, so I'd like to thank the three of you. I'd like to thank Stephen and Whitney and the seminar participants. It was really a wonderful end for this year. Thank you. Thank you all.